Hey YouTube, um, King Cobra JFS with another video. A couple nights ago, I got my uh, shotgun stock engraved. I didn't use a wood burner per se. I used a um, pen. So, to show you what I did here. Now, on one side we got the day I purchased it, which was April twentieth. So, four twenty, right there. Okay. I got a nice little pot leaf right there, and got my name on top of that. And then it's got the shotgun's name, which is Bad and Company. Right there. Kind of, kind of see it. If you flip it over, it's got a um, ten-pointed star. It says, We the People up on top, and it says USA on the bottom. And then on the side right here, it says ZRT. So, yeah, that's what I did to my stock. I took a pen to it and engraved it. I think it turned out pretty cool. Now, what's the deal with people on YouTube who watch a video that they know they're not going to like just so they can bitch about it? Some comments were given on my last video, and I deleted all the comments on my last video. Because I'm like, really? I'm trying to spread awareness for a good cause here. And you're going to sit there and talk your shit. There's, <coughs> there's been times that um, I go check the views on a video and uh, the dislikes are more than the um, views on the video, which tells me that people aren't even watching the video. They're just there to uh, just like the video and go about their day because they can. And to me, that's just like, wow, you got nothing better to do with your lives. Raw fucking O. <laughs> yeah. I've added more fireball to this drink combination. I've also added vanilla Dr. Pepper float. And, uh, yeah. It's got smoky peach moonshine, uh, Jim Beam honey, a um, Mountain Dew of sorts. It's an odd off flavor that's not really commonly found. It's one of those purpley pink mountain dudes, I can't remember which one it was. And uh, it's got uh, Fireball and, um, yeah, it's got a bunch of different drinks thrown into it. And uh, I like, and it's also got evil cherries in it too, or a evil cherry, I should say. It's pretty good stuff. I like it. It's good. But people talk about saying it's in the Constitution, right? Well, the other day I found out that the father of our Constitution smoked marijuana before he wrote the Constitution. He said it gave him the hindsight or the inspiration to write it. Go figure. So you can picture, if you will, a late night, a burning candle, a feather and quill, some ink and a pipe and some weed and a light to go with it. And yeah. Not only that, but I'm pretty sure the Constitution was drafted on hemp paper, so, yeah. But these are things the government doesn't want you to find out. I might be just some drunken, rambling autistic here, but you get what I'm saying. And another thing, too. People going off about how Barack Obama was our first black president. Actually, he's our first half black president. I'm sorry if that sounded racist, but that's just the truth. You know? That's why whiteies were. Eh, okay with voting for him, I guess. Sit there and say I'm full of shit, but you know I'm right on that issue. So come this November, Wyoming is electing a new governor, and uh, my vote is for Senator Byrd. I'm voting Democrat. Because another thing I found out is that Republicans refuse to vote for equal pay rights for women, and that's just downright disgusting in my opinion. 
And women work just as hard as men, if not harder sometimes, and therefore they should deserve the same pay. It's just the way I see it. You can disagree with me on all you want, but it's just the way I see it. But some part of Republicans' masculinity would feel threatened if women got equal pay as men. They'd be like, uh, you know, because a lot of these old farts are stuck in this mentality of 1950s where the wife stays at home and vacuums while the man goes off to work, comes home with a pipe and slippers and says, Honey, I'm home. Give me a fucking martini and a paper. <laughs> Again, that's very <coughs> Ooh, old school mentality here. But, uh, yeah, and um, I'm disgusted, really, <laughs> you know. And that's just the thing is, some of these Republicans are women, which really boggles my mind. You know, some of these women who voted for, it's just like, really? You're so brainwashed by your part, political party. Just, whatever. And again, not all Republicans are like this, but the ones that are really nasty and mean and just downright stupid and politically inept, the media focuses on them, and as a result, Republicans get a bad name. You know. And the same can be said for liberals and Democrats, too. You know, the extremes of both parties are what the media generally tries to focus on, and as a result, both parties get this image of we're trying to bite each other's heads off. And they are to us, to us, to a degree, but Okay, did the father of our constitution smoke weed? Let's see. Another important and rarely discussed influence on the founders was their addiction to mind-altering substances. Well, it's important to understand that in the 18th century, drinking water could be downright dangerous and it might not actually kill you because of the parasites that were in tainted water supplies. So it's not unreasonable to think that the big ideas of the, the kind of revolutionary fervor that emerges out of secret meetings that are applied with alcohol is fed by booze. I think that the founding fathers must have been stoned and plastered during that whole period. Beer, whiskey, and wine flowed freely. But was another kind of contraband fueling a new America? Hemp. Early American marijuana. When I found out about hemp, it was totally a surprise. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper. The Constitution is printed on hemp paper also. And so are most of our early founding documents from all the states. That thin, crisp paper that Bibles are printed on, that's hemp paper. In addition to our documents, our first flag was on sailcloth, all of which was made from hemp. Even the clothes on the colonials' backs were made from hemp. It was a very patriotic thing during the war to be clothed in homespun. Benjamin Franklin, the, the whole idea was when he went to Europe and was wearing homespun, that was hemp. That was 100% hemp. Homespun has never been anything but hemp. The founding fathers all grew hemp. Thomas Jefferson not only invented a new method for breaking down the fibers in the plant, he brought back newer and stronger strains from a seed collecting trip to France. Thomas Jefferson actually said there's no greater thing you can do for a country than to add a 
useful plant to its culture. He was probably looking all over the world for the right hemp to grow in Virginia. He was really into him. George Washington said many times over, make the most of the hemp seed and grow it everywhere. He had a 40 acres in the, in the south of his property that uh, they grew hemp. Hemp was the single most useful crop in colonial America. Sails, ropes, flags, banners, uniforms, log books, all that was made out of hemp. So it, it took 80 tons of hemp to outfit one sailing ship. And that, that 80 tons meant 350 acres of hemp had to be grown just for one sailing ship. But were they smoking it? I ban substance today, uh, a plant that gets you high, uh, was something that was smoked regularly by the founding fathers. So the, the whole, you know, the founding fathers, in addition to being drunk all the time, may have been high. But ultimately, the drug the founding fathers had the most success with wasn't hemp. It was tobacco. We know now that tobacco is like the most addictive drug there is. And we got England hooked on it, and they loved it, and they couldn't have enough. Two or three times as much money could be made by growing tobacco. So tobacco was the number one crop in early, early America. And really, uh, drugs started our country. Besides hemp production, George Washington had other secrets, too, that paint a far different picture than the classic poses we are so familiar with. George Washington had a tremendous reputation, both as a leader on the battlefield uh, and as a lover in the bedroom. From my research, I found, indeed, there was a group that I call the Founding Girlfriends. There were at least nine women during the war who could say in all honesty that George Washington slept here. One of Washington's supposed lovers was Kitty Green, the wife of Nathaniel Green, one of Washington's most trusted generals. She was like, uh, you know, a Revolutionary War groupie. She always went to the battles, and Nathaniel Green was telling her, stay home, stay home like the other wives. At six foot two inches, Washington towered above most men of his day. He was an imposing figure and magnetic on the dance floor. This is Kitty Green's dance card from one particular ball during the Revolutionary War. Every dance was promised to General Washington. Strangely, this is the same night Kitty's husband, General Green, was called away by Washington for a secret midnight mission to meet a man in a distant county the man never showed up, and Green wrote it was a wild goose chase. Now, there are those who imply that uh, there is some hanky-panky going on, and uh, there are others who might say that uh, Washington was merely discussing his strategy for the next battle with Kitty Green. Uh, two points of view. But I, <laughs> I, being a humanist, think that Washington, having been away from Martha for so long, may have had other thoughts other than the campaign strategy. And do the founding fathers also have hidden agendas at work in our most sacred documents? There's no accident that the nations are there and that they're ever involved. History Channel. Two books got you. Biometry. 1787. The Founding Fathers gather in Philadelphia to hash out the most important and dangerous document in the history of the United States. This document, founded on an act of treason, will be the foundation, the moral and political vision for a new nation. And all of the secrets, their deep thinking about spiritual matters, their ties to secret societies, their altered states of consciousness, all converged to create the United States of America. The Founding Fathers didn't just dream this up out of thin air. Throughout, 
the influence of one particular group permeates Independence Hall. Is the secret vision of a new world order finally being realized by the Founding Fathers? It's no accident that the nations are there and that they're heavily involved. It is a fact that many Masonic concepts and the actual functioning of the Masonic system really did make its way into the Constitution. Okay, pause for a second here. Is this the same New World Order that is trying to force resistance people to accept the imposed... Oh, I mean... Wait till it uh, continues playing there. Words. Uh. You know, the best selling thriller from Da Vinci Code author Dan Brown is uh, the new one is called What is the Lost in Boston? Lost in set in the nation's capital, and it's centered on the world's oldest and largest fraternity. Brown's book has renewed interest in the Freemasons, and as Elaine Quijano tells us this morning, it is a secret society that is still very well represented in Washington. John and Karen, for all the conspiracy theories about Freemasons, this much is true. They can still be found at the highest levels of American government. From the Capitol to the White House. Freemasons throughout history have freely roamed the halls of power in Washington. Nine of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons, as were more than a dozen U.S. presidents, including George Washington, who famously laid the cornerstone of the Capitol building clad in his ceremonial Masonic apron. These days, Masons can still be found in powerful government positions. Masonic historian Arturo de Hoyas. We have egalitarian ideas. We believe that people should rule themselves, that they should elect their own leaders, that they should be governed by constitutions, have separations of power. Senator Chuck Brassley is a Mason, so is Senator John Tester. But getting someone to chat about it can sometimes be tricky. I'm doing healthcare. <laughs> Senator Mike Enzi didn't break stride while explaining why he's part of the secretive society. It's a brother that goes on constructing good men. Yet behind these closed doors... I became a mason in my local lodge in Beckley, West Virginia. Secrets reveal... This is this is very second degree. Congressman Nick Ray Hall, a mason for almost four decades, decoded masonry's most prolific symbol. You may see the compass in the square, it symbols of tiny training, uh, we live by the square, we're upright individuals. The congressman describes masonry as a fraternity. He says his mentor and fellow Mason, West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd, nominated him for membership. As a 33rd degree Mason, the highest level in the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Congressman Ray Hall acknowledges there are a lot of secrets and codes, but he says they're not sinister. So are you trying to rule the world? Well, let's say no. But if we were going to tell you, no. Congressman Ray Hall says Freemasonry today is more of a social organization and despite the prominent positions of some members, is not a forum to discuss power politics. John, Karen? Elaine Kihana this morning. Elaine, thanks. We should all... Hmm. So after seeing this video... Hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. I spoke here is wrong. Well, I'm sorry if I'm a bad speller. <laughs> Bastards. You gotta love grammar Nazis on YouTube. You spelled she was wrong. Uh. Well, thanks for informing me. Now I'm going to remove your comment. Ass. But yeah, there's your um, proof. Huh? 
and uh, the information presents itself, obviously. So, yeah. <sighs> Until then, this is, um, King Cobra JFS with another video, and, uh, Thanks for watching. See you all later.